Um, so now we arrived at session seven, where we already uh, are at the um, last session of the workshop. And uh, uh, the last session will be about um, wrapping up and summarizing the different sessions. And the other thing that I would like to remind you of that please uh, go into Slido and give your feedback to um, your impression on the uh, workshop and how it was organized and about um, the topics uh, in general. Um, so if you have questions during this uh, session seven, you can of course use the Q&A facility. Um, I don't know if there is uh, a lot of time to discuss. Um, I will start now with summary from uh, session one and uh, then uh, hand over uh, to the other um, chairs of the sessions that will then summarize their um, session. So um, I will share my screen. Um, yes. Okay, good. So um, I would like to um, summarize the first session that we had yesterday morning. Uh, the session was chaired by Jana Kola, uh, uh, the ESPRI chair, and the session was about the current state of e EOSC and the EOSC Association, and was also explaining the scope of the workshop. So speaker from the European Commission was uh, Kostas uh, Glinos, head of UN, uh, unit Open Science. And Ute Kunzenheimer, uh, she was Secretary General of the EOSC um, Association. And uh, there was also a presentation uh, from the task force uh, in S3. So um, by what uh, Francisca said uh, today, uh, I will explain to people and users that do not know about the era. So the European research area is the, the ambition to create a single and borderless market um, for research, innovation, and technology across Europe. And uh, within this uh, uh, era, uh, action number one is dedicated to EOS, as Jana mentioned um, yesterday. And its next step in this action is to open uh, sharing seamless access, uh, access and um, rela uh, reliable reuse of research outputs. So um, important um, is um, that uh, we should um, be um, aligned with the um, S3 white paper actions as mentioned by Jana and that uh, S3 will continue to support the development of, of EOSC and that also uh, Europe should continue to support such developments that we should um, in, uh, invest in um, educating uh, data professionals that are very much needed uh, for this. And then um, as is very important that EOSC uh, should not be a top-down initiative, but that um, it should be also modeled and co-created by the research infrastructures and um, uh, end users uh, of EOSC. And for this also, this workshop was uh, organized um, as we know. The S3 task force in EOSC will continue um, to follow up on the EOSC developments, build relationships with the uh, different EOSC structures, um, will coordinate the S3 inputs into the EOSC activities and fostering an active um, role in EOSC and the um, European research area. Then uh, also promotion of the research community um, needs and their role to co-design uh, um, and uptake and so, so, uh, sustainability of EOSC. Then uh, we will continue to organize targeted meetings and workshops. And um, this, of course, uh, in close cooperation with the S3 EOSC cluster projects and the EOSC Association. Um, then um, in the talk from the, um, oh, sorry, oops. I don't know what's happening now. Yes, this is um, um, the summary from the talk uh, by uh, Costas, is that uh, um, the uh, S3-EOSC synergy um, should uh, or will work to everybody's advantage for making best use, use uh, of the huge expertise 
between these two initiatives for sizing all digital opportunities to enable the culture, uh, cultural shift um, in the way um, European researchers do science. This is a very important point. The S3 research infrastructures can act as mediators between the end users and the EOSC by fostering the adoption of open science practices. Uh, the ERA uh, plans to combine the strengths of co-creation, mobilization, programmatic alignment and synergies at European and member state level together with open science skills and world-class interconnected research infrastructures. As we and EOSC in the po po uh, ERA policy um, agenda, there are two main actions which are important as mentioned before. Action one um, is um, dealing with EOSC and um, saying that to enable the open sharing of knowledge and the reuse of research outputs, including um, uh, through the development of the European Open Science Cloud. And in action um, eight, there is the strength, uh, strengthening of research um, infrastructures, strengthening the sustainability and accessibility and re resilience of RIs in the era. And uh, important point is the success of EOSC will largely depend on the change of culture among the researchers um, to, towards um, openness um, of data. Then we heard um, uh, a summary uh, from the EOSC um, Association uh, about the um, EOSC governance and how the status uh, is there. So, uh, how the member base uh, looks. So we have uh, 161 members, 73 obs observers. Uh, there are five advisory groups, uh, 13 task forces. We heard also yesterday a lot about the work of these task forces. Um, then um, there was um, a focus of the uh, S3 projects and S3 landmarks and the involvement in the ASC Future project. Um, there should be a close collaboration, or there's a typo here, um, uh, with the cluster projects in uh, from Horizon 2020. This was uh, always uh, already the case. And in the future, there uh, will be a collaboration of the EOSC um, Association with S3 to plan uh, the stages uh, of uh, the European Open Science Cloud for the period of 23 to 24. And uh, for this, um, uh, the idea was to uh, establish a dedicated uh, channel uh, and to uh, have active participation of the S3 projects and landmarks uh, in the upcoming MRI uh, consultation and collaboration um, with S3 to organize the EOSC partner days. Yes. So this was a summary from uh, session one. And um, now I have to end, yes, my presentation. And then I would like to hand over um, to Suzanne for summarizing uh, session two. Yeah, thank you very much, Miriam. So the session two was about the EOSC reserves for engagement and adoption. We started by a presentation from uh, Sir Karen Graham uh, about the role of the task force and the task uh, uh, plan within the, the EOSC Association Task Force on Research Engagement and Adoption. Then we had a presentation from Zoe Cunha about the role of young researcher in open science fair and the adoption of EOSC. And uh, we finished by two very concrete use cases uh, from Anne Fouillou and Petre Tchermark and about the Jupiter uh, no, notebook uh, and uh, the whole, uh, whole workflow to, uh, to come from uh, the collection of data to the publication and Petre about uh, another uh, uh, conception or vision of uh, what we could add to FAIR with the trustworthy data and uh, the fact that uh, even um, grant application can be uh, openly uh, shared even unsuccessful one. So what we what we discussed uh, in the different presentation, but also thanks to the, the question uh, from the audience, is that indeed uh, we are now in the time to put more coordinated effort towards the researcher engagement. Uh, from the what Sverka mentioned, the researcher are not only users but also providers. So that means the task force has to deal with the two uh, phase of the researcher uh, activity. 
Uh, this, uh, this aspect raised a couple of issues, uh, not coming only from a Sverker representation, but also from the others. First, how to make them uh, aware of the existing tool and how they work, uh, what is their purpose. Uh, this uh, arises uh, mainly from the AN presentation. How to facilitate open science and fair practices. Uh, it was mentioned mainly by Zoe, but also for, for, by the others about the role of the young researcher. Uh, which is usually supposed to do the work while advanced researchers are doing the research. Uh, so it's a kind of uh, uh, interesting repartition of work in the scientific world, uh, which can be discussed uh, maybe uh, to see if uh, indeed there is a difference between managing data and using tool uh, and uh, doing research. Uh, this is uh, something uh, maybe we should consider uh, to facilitate the onboarding of, uh, of researchers into the years. And we all conclude and agree, uh, as it was very uh, clear from the, uh, the feedback from the audience uh, about the role and the importance of use cases in order to facilitate the adoption of EOSC by the researcher, and the importance to have a clear identified uh, research workflow uh, to facilitate the knowledge of uh, tools and the complementarity between here, I just would like to mention, uh, if, because it came when I prepared the, the summary of this session, I mean, would like to mention the masterpiece of uh, Umberto Eco, uh, lector in Fabula, uh, as I come from the literature uh, discipline, uh, where uh, Umberto Eco um, uh, developed the concept of the active reader. Uh, and I would like to suggest today the active user uh, for, the, uh, for the EOSC. Uh, the active reader has to build, contribute, and create the knowledge and the meaning uh, of, uh, of a piece of work at the same level as the author, but on the other side. So there are two phases of the interpretation of the, uh, of the, the work. Uh, and this is maybe where uh, we can um, uh, build upon this, uh, this, um, this theory uh, to see how the EOSC researcher can be and should be an active user meaning both receiving and producing the knowledge or data. Uh, and that implies to have both a delimited perimeter uh, of action, uh, which is something that we are currently, uh, that is built uh, with the EOSC architecture and the kind of services, but also freedom to adapt uh, and uh, to play with the different services and what, we, what is uh, offered to uh, the researcher. So this kind of flexibility is, uh, highly important in the building of the EOSC, and it has been mentioned uh, uh, later, especially with the, the different um, names used to, uh, to, to speak about the, the expertise or the skills uh, of people in the EOSC. So we had the EOSC promoter, uh, Zwerker mentioned the research mediators, um, Petr mentioned he presented himself as an open data enthusiast, so we are all working, or we are all uh, today EOSC practitioners. Uh, that would uh, be the, 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 the name I would suggest. Um, this is maybe something on which here again, uh, we can all work as a collective, uh, as a coll yeah, in collectively uh, to see how we can create a kind of classification of EOSC or open science actors uh, from the, the one who has only a sure, quick interest to the expert by, uh, by doing uh, open science. Uh, it also raised the question of how to divide the responsibility between research infrastructure and individuals. This is something we, uh, so we have seen, especially in the PET presentation, when he mentioned the trustworthy data and the differences, uh, what uh, the research infrastructure can take, uh, how they can uh, contribute to develop trustworthy data and how the user uh, can, uh, it can facilitate the work for the user for, for the reuse, the fairization aspect uh, for the user. And he also raised the question of, uh, should we certify a research infrastructure uh, in this uh, perspective? And of course, this kind of EOSC practitioners can be uh, either for individual and or for organization. This is something to be, um, to be discussed and maybe uh, consider uh, in the project or even in the in the EOSC Association Task Force. And that's it for the for the, the summary of uh, this uh, session two. So now I hand over maybe to session three. And uh, I think it was Sarah. 
Yes, exactly. It's Sarah. Okay, thank you, Miriam. Yes, uh, can you see my screen properly? Yes. Okay, perfect. So we now move to the reporting from session three. Session three was focusing on the EOSC added value for the thematic communities, especially on how can research infrastructure and user benefit from EOSC. We had six speakers in the session, Yanis Ioannidis from Athena Research Center and EOSC Future Coordinator, Sarah Jones from Geant and EOSC Association, Ariasmi from University of Helsinki and the Embry Cluster, Niklas Blomberg from Elixir, Eleni Tolli from Athena Research Center and the NIFOS Regional Project, and Carl Presser from Premotech and the uh, Food Cloud. Uh, the main topics that we discussed in the session was uh, the EOSC implementation visions and current status, the role of the clusters in the EOSC, and also the added value of EOSC for thematic community, communities, research infrastructures, but also regions. Uh, we started the discussion uh, uh, talking about the vision for the EOSC implementation, and indeed we remarked the fact that EOSC is to provide services and data that should simplify the life of researchers, so make their work more efficient and easier. Uh, these services and data are not coming out from the blue, but they are coming from the existing infrastructures and research infrastructures. And uh, we also talk about the inclusiveness of EOSC, especially in re the reference to the catalog. So there were quite many questions during the sessions whether different type of services could be considered as part of the catalog, and the answer was indeed yes. So EOSC plans to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, EOSC, we lacked as the glue, and especially this concept that came out when discussing also the plans of EOSC future, meaning that uh, um, EOSC is trying to bring together uh, infrastructures and research infra infrastructures to make sure that these services are interoperable, accessible and discoverable in a seamless way, and thus reusable by different actors and disciplines. Uh, Another important concept that came out from the session is that there won't be a unique point of access. Uh, when the EOS portal was mentioned, the EOS portal is indeed a key um, component of EOS, but it's one, only one of the access points. And um, the vision of EOS as a system of systems has been highlighted once again. Uh, then we started discussing the role of the clusters when in respect to EOSC, and indeed the ESPRI clusters are acting as intermediaries or mediators, to use the term that Suzanne just mentioned, between EOSC and the research infrastructure. And the main purpose there is to make the research infrastructure services reusable in EOSC by other research infrastructures. Another interesting concept that was highlighted yesterday is that the clusters are acting as enabling platforms for the development of new thematic services. This is not only strengthening the alignment within the S3 domains, this is also a feature that is, was very appreciated during the session by the researchers, because they can see this as another value for their work. Clusters also have a key role in being a reference point for those building or approaching the establishment of new research infrastructures, because they have a clear understanding of the landscape of the EOSC features, so they could be really a key contact point for those starting now. Um, EOSC definitely brings to the clusters potential for true interdisciplinarity, and uh, this was something uh, that for which there was a broad consensus in, in the session. Uh, in the session, then we moved to the use cases and two thematic use cases were presented, one on the COVID-19 data platform and the by COVID project, and the second one on food nutrition security from the food cloud uh, project. In both uh, use cases, I think there were three main points uh, coming up. Uh, the both showcases show both um, use cases showcase that identifying combining different data types uh, not only as a scientific value but also and mainly a societal value. So they really showcase uh, the other value of bringing in different uh, uh, data 
types, uh, different services for a specific brand challenge. Uh, research infrastructures have also developed solutions for domain specific needs that can be reused in other contexts. And combined with EOSC can provide a broader and, and higher added value for the researchers. So again, the theme of combining research infrastructures and infrastructures can bring added value. Uh, finally, EOSC can provide key building blocks for the S3 research infrastructures, as well as the national infrastructures and centers. And this is really mainly to strengthen the scientific services provided by research infrastructures or national infrastructure. Uh, the session ended with the last use case that came from one of the regional projects, the NIFOS Europe project, focusing on the Southeast uh, Europe. And uh, from that presentation, it was clear that, I mean, we need to take into account the different needs and the different levels of maturity of the different regions, not only from a technical perspective, but also from a policy uh, or adoption perspective. So tailored efforts are needed to best support the region. And uh, I think we can conclude with this statement that EOSC needs to be inclusive, embracing regional requirements and needs in addition to the thematic once. And that's my concludes my reporting. So I stop sharing. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for this very comprehe comprehensive summary. Then I would like to uh, hand over to uh, Suzanne again for uh, wrapping up and summarizing uh, session four. Yes, thank you, Miriam. Uh, I was asked by uh, by Costas, uh, who cannot be uh, be there today, to uh, to um, summarize the, the session four. So the session four yesterday was the last of the day. It was a feedback panel for users. Uh, EOSC added value for end users, so it was uh, the occasion to discuss how the research infrastructure community can benefit from EOSC uh, by mentioning uh, the developers, the policymakers, and the funders uh, regarding uh, the users. And part of the panel uh, were uh, Sverker Ongren, Yanis Ioannidis, Sarah Jones, uh, Ari Asmi, Petr Chermark, and Anne Fuyu. So uh, people who, we, who, uh, who were at the two previous uh, sessions, session two and uh, session uh, three. Uh, so what has been noticed uh, from uh, both the question to the audience and to the panelists is that uh, it seems that there is a good knowledge of the EOSC, what is the EOSC, the ecosystem, but a strong necessity to improve its uh, implementation. So we had very good results from the audience about the EOSC ecosystem knowledge, even if, as uh, some of us noticed, uh, actually all of us, I guess, uh, the question was a bit biased by the context, but at least uh, the results were very positive. Uh, however, it was not the same at all regarding the access and implementation of EOSC, uh, where we had uh, more than 50% of people uh, which neither agree or disagree uh, that uh, it was quite easy to, uh, that the implementation of EOSC was uh, easy to, uh, to understand. So what has been um, said from the panelists uh, is that it's a kind of fair um, uh, comment, uh, feedback, uh, because uh, building the EOSC implies to have several steps of development. Uh, and here I can just uh, support what, uh, what uh, Klaus uh, just uh, said at the last uh, session today about the fact that we need to believe in the EOSC and to uh, uh, continue working uh, if we want to, uh, to have something successful. So first, uh, in the previous step, we, uh, we were obliged to, we had to work on the invisible architecture to create interoperability between the tools and collaboration between infrastructure. And now uh, I think we can say we are entering into a new phase where we try to bring in uh, much more of the community into the EOSC, uh, which implies for us, for all of us, to clarify the process, uh, the role of the services, uh, and uh, uh, bring a bit of uh, simplification. So what has been said yesterday, but also today in the last uh, panel session, uh, actually, is that using services doesn't mean knowing what is behind. So the researcher or the user uh, don't need to know uh, really about the EOSC. They don't care actually about the EOSC. Uh, what they need is the, what kind of services they can use for doing what uh, with easy access to those services. 
and easy use as well to those services. So the EASC will be known uh, through the services uh, it provides and several examples uh, uh, were made uh, from uh, um, from Costas, but also from Francisca de Jong, and it has been mentioned also today about Eduroam or the World Wide Web. About uh, we also had a discussion about uh, what kind of reward uh, we can conceive for the researcher, and uh, one of the question what uh, was about tracking DOI citation. So not only about public tracking publication of the researcher, but also the DOI of uh, coming from data. Uh, of course, this was something we, the, the panelists um, uh, actually support, but not only. Uh, Yanis in particular mentioned the need to open to all the research output that are created, the software, the APIs, the data, the publication, uh, why not the scripts, uh, which were mentioned by Petr in his uh, presentation. And we can also highlight the quality of the research output, uh, which should be uh, taken into account. So not only the DOI, uh, not only the numbering, but also the qualitative uh, aspect to work on the rewarding of the of the result. And uh, then uh, we move to uh, the, the the needs to move to, from the technical approach, uh, which is of course still necessary because uh, especially the discussion today about the Earth portal and the role of the Earth Future project uh, were uh, very uh, uh, interesting and show the need that there is still a lot of discussion about the technical approach, but we also should uh, evolve with toward a more scientific approach in order to facilitate uh, the onboarding of the researcher. And here the role of the research infrastructure uh, was uh, clearly uh, mentioned uh, several times uh, and as well as today, by the, by the way. So a kind of summary, and here I tried to, uh, to reuse the points mentioned by, uh, by Costas yesterday uh, when he uh, did uh, the summary. Uh, so he mentioned the visibility of the EOSC through uh, the services and their efficiency, uh, the importance of rewarding data sharing, so the quality and not only data, the peer review and not only publication for research products. He also mentioned uh, the, the outreach uh, which uh, should be done, uh, of course, directly through the users, but also by targeting intermediary. Uh, the panel discussed the libraries, for instance, the role of the libraries, and a lot of work to be done on the EOSC platform. Only 20% of people thought it is attractive. So this was uh, the beginning of uh, my summary. Uh, so need to, there is a need to simplify the access and the understanding of the services. And lastly, uh, the panel discussed the skills for researcher which were linked to the rewarding of data sharing. And I hope it was quite um, uh, relevant with the, 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 what has been said uh, during the, the panel uh, yesterday afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Susan, for uh, excellently summarizing this session. Uh, then I would like to hand over to Pear for session five um, to summarize. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so this was the first session of today. So not much time. So I, ho I, I hope you have it still fresh in mind and not much time to make a more uh, elaborate uh, presentation. But uh, we had uh, five presentation and a discussion following, following on that. The, the theme for the uh, session was how generic and thematic EOSC services can add value to the research, infra, research infrastructure community. And uh, I think that uh, was made very clear through these five talks. We had a talk about the EOSC platform, getting some more details, what is happening coming from the EOSC Future project. Uh, by, by class uh, Virenga and the, the regional project uh, in especially in in that Isabel Campos talked about and uh, what are the contributions there and what you have what what is going on uh, and then it was a more specific talk about the Elixir authentication authorization tool and how you build a uh, AI infrastructure that first is for a specific research community, the Elixir community, and now being more generalized to the whole life science community and a number of, of life science research infrastructures are adopting it. And then about 
about a marketplace, the uh, uh, social science and humanities open marketplace, Fra Francisca de Jong from the Clarin Eric, and uh, how uh, it actually can provide services then for a specific use, uh, user community. And then it was about more general uh, thing and then also quality of metadata, the fairs fair Fuji tool, and how you can automize a bit of the, the uh, checking here by Ron Huber from University of Bremen and Fairs Fair project. So what we learned from this uh, presentations very clearly is that the uh, thematic uh, research inf or the, and the re research infrastructures and their services is of definite value for uh, their researchers and also from a broader for a broader community. Uh, and uh, of course, if you are involved in the research infrastructure, I think this is very natural. You you are using these tools and and uh, you you find them easy and uh, but the ambition of the research infrastructure say especially these that are distributed is of course to enlarge the community that benefit from from their services uh, and of course it's all, we also learned that the generic research infrastructures uh, re, re, generic e infrastructures I mean, the uh, Xi'an, the EGI, EUDAT, uh, and so on, are very much, I mean, they are of value, maybe mainly for the research infrastructures when they are building their, uh, their tools and, and practices. Uh, and, and that is to, to keep in mind. But one should also keep in mind here that both the generic e infrastructures and the research infrastructures, especially research infrastructure, of course, that are distributed and uh, they build on national and regional and uh, thematic labs around Europe. So uh, it is a um, where, of course, there is much more understanding and local knowledge about users and, and closeness to the users of these tools. So there, there are um, an engagement here that is overall much larger than it could look sometimes when we talk about EOSC as a top-down uh, initiative. And uh, I think this is an engagement also that everybody here demonstrated very well that how to, how to uh, take benefit from and, and make use of and uh, enhance and uh, really provide services that, this, that use and disseminate the open science practices and the fair principles to, on a, more, to a more general uh, audience of the, of the research community. So, in short, that was session five. Thanks very much, Pea, uh, for this comprehensive uh, summary. Uh, then I would like to um, uh, hand over to uh, Ignacio for session six. Yes, so let me share my screen um, and see if I can put it on presenting mode. Can you confirm me that you can still see it in presenting mode? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay, Very good. Okay, so um, yes, let's try to make a wrap up of this last session. So I um, apologize if I was not able to cover all the things that were discussed in this short time, but I'll try to do my best. So I invite also the panelists to put any comment in the chat if they consider that it was not well addressed there. So this session was a very lively session with uh, a very active panel that was formed by the five presenters that we have in the previous session, Klaus Virenga, Isabel Campo, Jonathan Ted, Ted uh, Francisca de Jong and Robert Huber, who were discussing, were presenting uh, their views from different points of view, from the point of view of the S3 um, uh, services, uh, from the point of view of the regional projects, from the point of view of EOC uh, future, and also from one of the services from the first first. So, oops, let me, yeah, go here. Yeah, let me, exactly. So basically the 
four points that we that were the topic of discussion of this session was the added value of EOC for the thematic providers internal international research infrastructure and say science clusters, the cooperation between thematic providers and generic providers in the context of EOC, and the, contrib the contribution of S3 and other world class research infrastructures, uh, especially in the in the concept of the federation of thematic infrastructure services and the role of national regional policy and initiatives. So the discussion was very intense. Uh, there were a lot of contributions from the audience. Um, uh, we'll, I mean, I think they were very useful. There were many comments that will not be able, we're not able to discuss in depth due to the amount of, 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 uh, of discussion. And the first point was uh, related to the added value of EOC. Uh, the audience clearly didn't perceive didn't perceive clearly the by a significant part of the audience the which was the, the benefit. But the panelists clarified very well. I mean, the panel was they had stressed that the EOC would provide a backbone, would provide core services, best practices, standards, interoperability guidelines, tools. And it was uh, perceived as a way to break the silos of the individual research infrastructure, individual disciplines, in order to avoid the, I mean, the replicated uh, work that is being done to address the same problems in different ways, and also to provide, to flexibilize, and also to make it happen, the collaboration between different disciplines, which was uh, stressed in, in several points. was. However, we see that this key for success to explain that EOC is not a competitor in this scene. May, actually, we say that many of these uh, provide many of these actors are already part of AOC, um, and they and we have to find a way to improve uh, uh, the, the message that the EOC will uh, help in improving access and collaboration. Another important point that was uh, addressed was the cooperation with the generic providers, like. NGIO, that uh, open air and the like. Um, clearly, this cooperation was not well perceived by the audience. Uh, I would say that maybe the audience, I mean, th th this was a, a complex um, concept for the audience because this cooperation may not be very uh, transparent for the, for every, maybe very transparent or may not be very clear for the, for many of the, of the people attending. But it was also, uh, stated during the, the discussion that, that we have to create um, a win-win situation because in some cases that we have a, a strong competition for some of the, the points in which it uh, reduces the, the cooperation. I mean, creating a clear, defining clearly the expertise domain, expertise areas will foster the collaboration, reduce uh, the, I would say the useless competition, not the useful competition because competition is always good. That will, could prevent sharing resources and knowledge among the different disciplines. It was also very clear uh, stated that uh, there was there are roles that are uh, very necessary by the, by the generic providers and also very clear from questions from the audience that were even saying that where, where are the CPUs that I will use or where are the basic resources in which I will lay on. And also it was important for the sustainability of the, of the whole initiative. There was another point on the role of the scientific cluster and research infrastructure towards federation. This is very uh, well um, appreciated by the, it was very well appreciated by the audience. Everybody understood that it was very important and even say that this is effective at this point. A federation will bring uh, the highest level researchers on the discipline on board on all the uh, initiative. This is also very important to take the maximum from the different um, disciplines and put them together. And there was a lot of discussion about the approach. And uh, I think that uh, uh, in general, we agree that there was a need of having both a bottom up but a top down approaches. The bottom top down what has been uh, traditionally uh, used to create the, the, the infrastructure, to create the services, to create the framework. And sometimes these, it, these services are this, uh, it did not, went sufficiently deep to reach all the actors or the key actors to make the things happen. And the bottom-up approaches are required, but this was also good, clear that the, the top-down approach uh, was needed to create the foundation for the federation to happen. As a class said that it was uh, uh, the first guy that both uh, telephone, didn't have no one to, to communicate with. With and but there was, I mean, it, it was not, it wouldn't be possible if there were no 
infrastructure behind that even at this moment was not clearly perceived as the uh, uh, the, the uh, solving uh, the problems that we'll address in the future. And also there was uh, some views that ESFRI can also help putting together all these actors and trying to um, talk, make them talk together. So finally, we discussed the role of the national and regional initiative and there was, was perceived very relevant. There were views that uh, in some cases do national um, initiative see EOC and other uh, infrastructure as a competitors. And this uh, is important to understand that these contributions are necessary already of concepts, it will play a minor role defining the interoperability to foster um, and to converge the federation. Also was uh, stressed that we have, we don't, we shouldn't go to an over-regulated uh, scenario, define best principle, define the common uh, points for, uh, and the minimum viable uh, standards and, and interoperability protocols in order to make the collaboration happen and then make it evolve as it, in many other federation has happened, successful federation has happened in the past. And also uh, it was important to, to be aware that national effort can be also bound to other national priorities that may not be uh, aligned or even could be orthogonal to other, to the European wide initiative requirements. A national in initiative also tend to replicate effort and it will also uh, be very important to, um, I mean, have this glue in order to uh, define the common goals. And that was everything from my side. Um, uh, apologize if I didn't cover all the points and I mean, very, uh, I think it was a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Ignacio, for, for this clear uh, summary, which is not easy with uh, such a session, and, um, uh, but it worked out uh, really, um, really well, I think. So let me share my screen to wrap up the, um, Yes, to uh, wrap up the session, I hope you uh, all see this. Um, do you see the presentation? Yes. So um, I just want to share with you, this is uh, um, some information that I got from the stress-free team that uh, we had 416 unique participants in the workshop um, uh, yesterday, uh, of which were 270 see. in parallel. Miriam. Yeah. We yes. cannot see uh, your slides. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, this is weird. Sorry. Um, let me see. Um, try. Okay, now, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, it's because I have two screens, so so that's sometimes um, giving a problem. Yes, okay. But uh, what I wanted to share with you is that um, we had uh, 416 um, unique participants and 270 uh, that were participating in parallel on this without uh, the speakers and, and panelists. And um, uh, just for your information, the presentations will all be available on the S3 website. And um, uh, we will um, make uh, uh, a report um, of this, uh, of this uh, outcome and the summaries of the different sessions so that at the end you can all uh, look, uh, look into this. And it was uh, great to see the fruitful discussions uh, during the last two days. And uh, it's very clear that, uh, that EOSC is really uh, becoming more mature uh, in services, uh, organization and, and governance in, in, in everything. What also became clear, and I think this was also one of the, of the goals of this workshop to, to organize it, is um, that the co-creation uh, with the um, end users is key and that more coordinated effort uh, into user engagement uh, should be invested. And uh, what I found, uh, a very uh, great is also the, the input from the young researchers uh, yesterday um, showing how they, how they use uh, EOSC. And um, well, it's, it's really clear that, that use cases are essential here and that can also help end users of EOSC very much in, in understanding it better. Um, as uh, um, uh, Klaas said, um, 
yes, uh, end users need to buy into EOSC and they need to believe in it because otherwise EOSC um, cannot exist and cannot be successful. Um, and um, yes, EOSC will be known through its services, uh, which is starting now and should become uh, like Adderom uh, in the future as we, as we hope. Of course, funding uh, for sustain, uh, sustaining and further developing these services uh, is essential. And uh, I think that, uh, uh, well, EOSC uh, uh, is at a, good, uh, at a good start and going in the right direction. Um, so uh, what we also saw is that the cluster approach is, is very efficient and, and seen as a very good um, uh, way of working. Um, and um, um, we are um, planning uh, probably a new workshop this year that will um, will be uh, then with the service providers of EOSC. And then um, to finalize, I would like to thank um, the people that worked uh, to plan this workshop, uh, which are the people uh, of the task force of S3 on the European Open Science Cloud, and also uh, people that were experts extra in the program committee, as uh, Rudolf Dimper from Panosk and uh, Ron Decker from Chester from the cluster projects, then uh, Sarah from EOSC um, Association and Suzanne, and of course the stress free uh, project and the Athena team that made it uh, possible to have everything uh, organized in the back background, and of course Fotis, who did uh, incredible work in uh, planning this workshop. And with that, um, I would, uh, would like to thank all the speakers and chairs and panelists again and uh, uh, close, close the workshop um, for um, today and uh, looking forward to meet you at the next workshop that the S3 task force is organizing face to face. Let's hope that this will be possible. So um, thank you very much.